Hello, and welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. I'm Anna Tinder from Burlington, Wisconsin, and I'm a senior in the Mead Witter School of Music studying violin performance. It is my pleasure to introduce Mead Witter School of Music Director Susan C. Cook. Today, Susan will be taking us on a tour of the beautiful new Hamill Music Center, the striking glass walled venue located on University Avenue in the heart of the UW Madison campus not only provides a state of the art facility for performers and audiences, but also offers the latest acoustical and recording technology for students. Susan is a professor of musicology and was formerly the academic associate dean for the arts and humanities in the graduate school. She also held the Walt Whitman Chair in American Culture Studies as part of the Fulbright Distinguished Teaching Program in the Netherlands. Her teaching and research focus on contemporary and American music of all kinds and demonstrate her abiding interest in feminist methodologies and cultural criticism. She has authored numerous essays, including Watching Our Step, Embodying Research, Telling Stories, on the gendered and racialized meanings of ragtime social dance, which won the Lippincott Prize from the Society for Dance History Scholars. Susan will be available for questions at the conclusion of this tour. Please welcome Susan Cook. Well, welcome everyone. I'm Susan Cook and I'm director of the Mead Witter School of Music. And it's a real pleasure to get to show you inside this wonderful building, the Hamill Music Center. We're here in this lovely lobby, uh, looking right out on University Avenue. Actually, one of the busiest intersections in town and one of the noisiest spaces in town. But I think if you were here, you would notice it's pretty quiet. And it's actually going to get quieter as we move into some of the other spaces. Uh, because that was the thing we needed most, was a space that was acoustically set up for our students and the music making that they do. So one of the things you might notice in this space is how the precast concrete that's on the outside of the building comes into the inside of the building and actually wraps its way around the other performance spaces here. So in essence, what you have in the Hamill Music Center is three concrete boxes, three performance spaces inside a larger concrete box. And so that's a great way of keeping the sound that we want in, in, and keeping the sound that we want out, out. Um, and so again, you can see that precast concrete panels that were made in Germantown for us. One of the other really lovely features of the lobby is this uh, beautiful architect designed lighting fixture that was actually a gift from the class of 1965. Um, and I think it, it is fitting for our, our university motto of Newman Lumen, of, of points of light and enlightenment. Um, again, it was designed for this space, so it, it activates the, the ceiling in a lovely way. And, uh, and during this whole horrible pandemic time, as I would drive by and see these lights still on, it was just a wonderful reminder that we would be back together again and that the space would be open again to audiences as it is now. Um, and the lighting fixture was made by a company out of Sheboygan, Manning Lighting, specially made family owned business. Uh, and as so many things in this building were locally produced or locally made. Uh, and I think indicative of the fact that when you invest in the university, you actually are investing in a whole host of Wisconsin businesses. And that certainly has been true of our uh, building. And if you could see up really close to, on those fixtures, it is made, the, the lighting fixture is made out of copper plumbing pipe. And that's sort of another wonderful feature of this building, I think, is that lots of beautiful touches, but made with utilitarian, down-to-earth materials, but with, a, with an eye towards design that makes it really quite lovely. Uh, and that was something that was important to me on this campus where we need buildings to last and we need buildings that will really serve our students well, that we wanted something that was an elegant building, uh, but was also rugged and down to earth and would 
stand up to student traffic and floors that we could keep clean once winter gets here. Uh, and that's what we've gotten. The other lovely thing about this space is that it just gives us a space to be before and after our musical events. Uh, we didn't have that in our former space over in the humanities building. It was a very tight lobby. And we knew we wanted a space where we could really celebrate what people uh, are doing. And what we did notice in the months that we were open before we closed during the pandemic was that after concerts, people stayed here and they talked and they talked about what they'd heard and their experience and that there was just something so wonderfully inviting about this lobby space with the light coming in and looking out on that active uh, roadway that, that people just wanted to be here and wanted to be together. Um, why don't we move on to the Collins Recital Hall? So this is the first of our three concrete boxes, as I said, within a larger concrete box, uh, a space named for Paul Collins, who's been a wonderful friend of the School of Music. Uh, Paul was an alum here, actually in the business school. His mother, Adele Stoppenbach Collins, was a music major here. And it's really in, as much in her honor as in Paul's honor that he, he wanted to give money to this building and, and to support our program. He knew growing up how important her, his mother had been to uh, West Bend, where he grew up, and um, how important music making was. And Paul Collins and his wife are actually great lovers of chamber music. So it seemed particularly appropriate to name the smaller space um, the more student-driven space in honor of Paul Collins. So here we are on the stage of the Collins Recital Hall. And a couple of things to, to point out. All of the wood that is in this space. Wood, of course, is just a wonderful material that picks up sound and continues to send it out there. You can probably even hear in my voice how there's more resonance in here. There's more of an echo. Wood is such a wonderful, warm space for that. And the, all of this wood was actually sourced from the Menominee tribal lands. Uh, they're wonderful in their forestry, very progressive in their forestry. Uh, and so this was maple that what came from, from their lands, uh, actually not high grade maple flooring, but actually maple that is, if you could look closer, you would see that there are, that there are blemishes or there are knot holes. There's a lot of again, activity in the wood. And that just helps with the acoustic as well because it just keeps the sound waves bouncing around in a lot of different, uh, different ways. The floor here too on the stage is end cut uh, wood. That again, give, makes for a very uh, comfortable stage to be on. Uh, it's a, um, it just has kind of a give to it. And again, it, it helps with the, with the sound here, the wood panels behind as well. One thing I didn't mention in the lobby, but you can really see it here, is that there's some strong color choices. And the architect had a very specific idea behind the color choices in the three different spaces. He again, in, in sort of reflecting on the campus and on Wisconsin, he decided to choose the color palette from the maple leaf, which is our state tree, and the kind of life cycle of the maple leaf as it goes through oranges into some yellows and then into almost the dark purples. And you'll see the dark purples when we go into the larger hall. The oranges here in the, in the draperies and in the uh, uh, design, the fabric on the chairs, 
And then we'll see the yellow, we'll pick up the yellow in the um, re rehearsal space. So again, celebrating the, the Wisconsin theme here, uh, our sense of ourselves here at the Meadwitter School of Music as the Wisconsin idea at its most audible. So it uh, seems to be, it's a lovely tribute to have the, the color choice in that way. A couple of other interesting Wisconsin touches um, is that there's Claire Story windows around the top here, so that this space is, has different lighting at different times of the day and can use natural lighting. Of course, Claire Story windows, a nod to Frank Lloyd Wright. That was something that of particular interest to him. And then we have this sort of silver trim here. So uh, uh, wood, but also with the silver metal. Um, and up above these tiaras, as the architect used to call, call them, these tiaras that hold the sound equipment and then above them, more wooden panels that help with the acoustic. This hall holds about 320 people, but we discovered that it, it's built in such a way that it feels as if the hall is filled with 20, 25 people. It has a wonderful intimacy to it, the way the chairs kind of wrap around you, the way you have the balcony kind of go all around you as well that it feels very comfortable, very intimate. It's very much a student-friendly space. Uh, and this is the space that all of our students do their, their junior and senior recitals. Um, so I think we'll move on to some of our technological spaces. Walk through the wood panels here at the back. out into the purple, from to the orange. To the blue, the blue being the behind the scenes color, kind of a nice calming color for students as they're waiting to go on stage. Uh, also a nod to our lakes as well. And uh, we'll find the recording studio. And I don't even remember where it is, down here. It's been a while since I've been here. Oops, pull. Something else that we were able to add in this building that we didn't have in, in our past space either was green rooms. So spaces for students and soloists and performers to be able to be by themselves, kind of gather their thoughts, change, get their music ready, be by themselves here at the back. So this is another nice professional addition that we have. So also what we wanted to make sure that we had here in this space was state of the art, not only a state of the art acoustic, but also state of the art technology, which of course became incredibly important when we were closed down for the pandemic. Uh, we were able to go from no concerts to being able to live stream concerts, bringing, student, bringing, bringing audiences in, into our space uh, via technology. Uh, and so, of course, having state-of-the-art technology was a real, real boon to us. This gives you some idea of our, our setup here in the studio, behind the scenes, as it were. Um, again, a lot of uh, the equipment came from Full Compass, a company here in Madison, and our wonderful members of our board, Jonathan and Susan Lipp. Uh, again, the nice cool blue colors and a lot of treatment on the walls to ensure, again, good, a good acoustic space. So the purple doors here, 
taking us into our large concert hall, the Mead Witter Foundation Concert Hall. Again, another Wisconsin business out of Wisconsin Rapids, investing in our, us and our program. So here we are on our much, much larger stage, our space for our large ensembles, vocal and instrumental, orchestral, a number of our uh, faculty ensembles play in here as well as our student ensembles. So this very large space in these rich purple tones and colors. And instead of the, the silver metallic treatment that was in the Collins Recital Hall, we have the copper here. And hand leafing that was done by the Conrad Schmidt Company and going around the uh, balcony, in, round by the choir loft behind, um, and then really adding such a warm tone. Um, so many people have told me that they almost feel like they're in a candlelit space in this hall, that the, the lighting is so warm, and um, just again, even in a very big space, makes you feel like you're part of something smaller, something, something more, more intimate. I think we're going to go up into the balcony, out the back. Should we just take the elevator? Welcome to the Hamill Music Center elevator. which is also a lovely thing to have. So actually, this is one of my favorite spots in the building. And it is because I didn't know it was going to be here. So when, after the building was open and I came over one morning to look at what was going to be my office space, and I came down here and here was this lovely window. And I, it just, it took me by surprise, but I just love the way that we're looking right there at the Chazen, so we're together here in this arts corridor. I love the fact that we were looking down uh, University Avenue, that very busy street, that um, we love having it here, but it's nice not to have to hear it in our spaces. And then looking over to the Humanities Building that's still there on the corner. And this, I just felt like this it was this wonderful, connection to the larger campus. Um, and then when I taught in person this last spring semester, I was over here early one morning, and we had just a, had a beautiful snowfall. And there was just a single tracks uh, of a student walking from one building to the other. Um, and I just loved seeing that as well, and just feeling the connections here with the building. So this is my favorite spot. And here's another interesting vantage point as well, looking out towards the library mall, but also looking out towards what will eventually, we hope, be our new teaching spaces as we move into the next phase of our building and we would move back um, this way. Of course, other buildings need to come down and other plans need to happen, but uh, eventually the, the hope would be that this actually is a hallway that would continue to another part of the building. Now we're coming into the choir loft, which is part of the balcony of the uh, large concert hall. And you can see up close these polka dots that are again a part of the acoustic treatment. When we get inside, you'll see that there are recessed polka dots as well as polka dots that stick out. And again, that's part of the acoustical treatment that allows the sound waves to keep being bounced around in different ways. And of course, then it becomes part of the sort of artistic treatment of the, of the building as well. Um, I didn't get to meet her, but uh, I understand that when we had one of the openings, um, a young woman whose family was part of the group that, that made the, the um, I think it was fiberglass, 
polka dots that stick out in the in the uh, res, uh, big hall came to to check on them and again that sense of of belonging that so many people have about this space or ownership or or just again kinds of family expertise um, that's on display here in the building so let's go into the choir loft Here we are now at the back of the hall, as you can see, looking down on the big stage where we were before. And we can have quite a large choir up here, so we can do big choir and orchestral kinds of works. We have a, a big one planned in the spring. Our new director of choral activities, uh, Dr. Mariana Ferrar, will be working with uh, combined choirs to do um, Carmina Burana in the uh, spring. So we think this will be a wonderful space with that, if you can imagine. This filled with singers, the stage filled with uh, the orchestra, and then of course our audience out there. So here you get a real good sense of the polka dots. Some of the polka dots that are recessed, other polka dots that are, uh, as I said, sticking out, the, the, the fiberglass ones. And again, all of that to help with the acoustic but again, picking up the, the purple treatment and the beautiful copper leafing that you can see as well. What we're going to do now is sort of take an interesting trip. We're going to go from the choir loft through hallways on the side here, which are part of the, again, the acoustic treatment. The architect often referred to them as the hall's ears. Um, again, a, a big empty space where the sound can bounce around and come back. We'll walk through that and we'll come out into the other side of the balcony, which is where there would be more um, seating. So you really get a behind the scenes view here. Uh, but if you come to one of our concerts, this is precisely what you can do, is walk from one space to the other. And if we're not doing a choir in the choir loft, that is absolutely open seating for any of our concerts. And um, it was already quite popular with students to sit up there and kind of feel like they're part of the orchestra, be able to look down on their colleagues who are playing away. So it's, uh, it's been a great, a great addition, not just as a choir loft, but as an audience for the audience. So here we are in the big ears, and you can really hear how resonant that is. It also provides some access up into the tech places for lighting, et cetera. But basically, this is just a big open space that can be resonant and allows us to actually have the size of the concert hall we have, um, but not having to have so much other volume ab above. Um, this is a, a more sort of, um, allows our footprint to be a little smaller, allows us to be a more efficient building, to have these ears back here that you can walk through. And out you come back into the balcony. And so as you can see, seating running along the side, so you got very close to the performers down below or if you would prefer to have a better vantage point, lots of space in the back. And so we were already noticing that different people were beginning to find their favorite seats in here. Uh, I actually am a big fan of the sitting on the side. I have the sense it's sort of being both alone and together with other people. I like it very much. We have other people that are very fond of the seats here in the front, seats in the back but really appreciating having this, uh, this large balcony. And now, of course, you can see we're looking back on the choir loft where we were. And as I said, if we're not doing a choir piece, that space is open for, for our audience uh, as well. And again, more of a sense of all the polka dots and the beautiful copper leaf. We're gonna go out now from the balcony and out into our upper lobby, which again has its own beautiful feel to it. 
and really adds to just the pleasure of being in the space and the opportunity to, to be together and to talk. And we actually have done some music in this upper lobby as well. It's, it's, uh, it's got its own wonderful acoustic feel and certainly is its own, own space. If you're up here playing, you're playing for the, for the whole lobby. So again, the beautiful plum colored tones. You can see more of the lighting fixture uh, up close. And then one of the other signature features of the building, which is this very nice staircase um, that kind of winds its way around. It has led people to ask us whether we're going to allow weddings to be in here. And uh, the answer is no. This is a dedicated music space. And so while we're very happy to share our space with others, we are really looking to share our space with other music folks that want to use this space for the purpose that it was uh, designed. Again, very functional terrazzo flooring here. Beautiful staircase, but also one that, that is um, going to be easy to keep up, easy to keep clean, and uh, adds a lot of, uh, lot of interest, um, well-being, as I said, uh, um, utilitarian. I think at this point, our last space to go into is actually the space we could have started in, um, and that is our, the rehearsal room. Uh, that's named for Singman and Florence Lee, who are the parents of one of our uh, donors, Jun and Sandy Lee, and it's also named for Annette Kaufman, um, who gave a, a legacy gift to the university as well. So this is a space that is basically, as it says, for rehearsals. It's another very student-driven space. Rehearsal halls are very important to us. It always seems like we never have enough. There's always more student activities or more kinds of things students want to do. So to be able to add this space, uh, to have this additional space to complement rehearsal rooms that are still in the Mossy Humanities Building was, um, was great to be able to do. It's a little bit bigger than um, some of our other rehearsal rooms. Uh, it certainly is safer for bigger ensembles because the acoustic is better. So we know that we're taking care of students' ears, that we're not subjecting them to too much sound, too much energy, uh, which is a real issue for, for musicians and their health. It also has another lovely feature as well. As you can see, we're moving into the yellow leaves of the maple. This space is very flexible, but has this wonderful natural lighting here on the corner. Again, as we look out onto campus, what a view, the students crossing University Avenue. They, walking by this space, can see what our students are doing. Our students are watching them as well. So this, again, this in and out. Um, another kind of, I think, Frank Lloyd Wright idea that what's happening on the outside comes on the inside, and we flow back through. Uh, again, when I, I taught last spring, um, I taught in this space because it was a big space where we could be safe and distanced. And it was just a lovely thing to teach a class at 8 o'clock in the morning and see the light change. Um, the students really respond to it. I mean, there's nothing like natural light. And so this is a space that, again, for students who do their rehearsals in the afternoon, uh, they're not hidden away somewhere in the basement. They're here. They know what's happening outside. They know how the weather's changing. Uh, and they've got natural light to illumine what they're doing. And again, this very, I think, peaceful, calming yellow colors works really well. Uh, we get some of the, the rings, the circles, that kind of uh, echo the polka dots from the other spaces, uh, from the big hall. 
Those uh, treatments, though, are, again, acoustic. They stick out, so they bounce the sound waves around. And they're also um, fabric covered so that they absorb some of the energy as well. So for large groups, again, as I said, we can make them safer. And there are draperies that come out uh, and as well. And you can see this is set up, I think, for probably one of our orchestral groups that would be meeting here in the afternoon. Chairs spread out, very, again, very flexible space. Um, and it's a space that the students have found really interesting to do their recitals in as well. We weren't expecting that. But because of the light, because of the way the room is set up, uh, it's, it's, it's worked really well for a more, again, intimate kind of student space. You might think it's in a, in a uh, rectangular, but it's actually, the walls are a little askew because, again, we don't want to set up the, the acoustic waves to bounce back too directly on each other. Where to now? Back out in the hallway? Just back around and then end. We're done, right? OK. OK, we'll do the student en uh, entrance, and then we'll just walk back. So we came out the back of the rehearsal hall. So we're in the back of the building. You can see from the blue colors, that's a little bit of the behind the scenes colors. We've got our wonderful, great number of bathrooms here that we, we were so adamant about making sure we had. We've got some wonderful storage for our percussion players. And basically, this is how the students usually come in and come out, because this is the closest access over to the Mossy Humanities Building. So we kind of think of this as the, the student uh, entrance. And then we're back here on the side of the lobby. Again, that precast concrete from Germantown, um, reminding us of, of how acoustically perfect our rooms are, bringing the outside of the building back into the to the inside, and we've pretty much come full circle back to the lobby where we started. So I really, really hope that this little taste of our building, this opportunity to kind of see some of it from the different vantage points will encourage you to actually come down and see and hear what we're doing. Uh, we have so many concerts that we put on faculty, students, you can find out about it on our website. Just come down and explore this uh, building for yourself. And again, to really experience why we have this building, which is to make it possible for our students to have the best kind of training and the best professional kind of experience possible for their music making. So again, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's been a pleasure to share this with you. And as I said, the Meadwitter School of Music is the Wisconsin idea at its most audible. So please come and join us. Thank you so much. Susan, thanks for sharing such a fantastic tour with all of our viewers today. Welcome and hello everybody. Fran Paleo Moyer, Badger Talks producer. We're talking to Susan C. Cook, who just gave a fantastic tour of the Hamill Music Center. Feel free to post your questions in the chat for Susan. She is taking questions. And we do have a question from Sue Regette, who's asking, where do students practice other than the large rehearsal hall at Hamill? Well, that's a great question because it allows me to remind folks that uh, this new space is our, our performing spaces and the one rehearsal room. But uh, most of our activities are still continuing in the humanities building. So that's where my office is still. Uh, that's where most of our classrooms are. And of course, down in the basement, that is where all the individual practice rooms are for students. So that's where you'll find most of our students doing their individual work. If they're within, within groups, then that's when they're using the large rehearsal space, either as part of a, a larger chamber ensemble or one of the larger organizations.
Fantastic. And you actually answered Susan Stemper's question as well, who was asking a very similar question about uh, rehearsal rooms. So Susan, you have quite a history on our UW campus. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit more about your background? You've been on campus for quite a while. I joined the faculty in 1991. Uh, I had came from a, a, my first teaching position was actually at a small college, Middlebury College in Vermont. Uh, and I came back to the Midwest, um, my, spent my Wonder Bread years in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, did my own undergraduate at Beloit College here in Wisconsin, and my graduate training at the University of Michigan. So I was delighted to come back to this part of the country that I loved so much and have the opportunity to work with graduate students as well as undergraduate students. Uh, and then after I was here, I've, I've had some other positions on campus, probably um, the, the longest one was serving as associate dean for the arts and humanities uh, in the graduate school. So I've really enjoyed my time getting to know all parts of this wonderful, wonderfully rich campus uh, and now back as director. And I'm in my ninth year as director of the Meadwitter School of Music. And apart from all of this administrative work, you also have a background in musicology and you have written several essays, it sounds like, many that have been uh, very uh, awarded. Well, um, yes, I should have said that I came back in 1991 to join the music faculty as a music historian uh, with a specialty in contemporary musics and American musics. And I still do teach a course a semester uh, even as director. So in the spring, I'm actually teaching a course that's largely for non-majors and it fulfills the ethnic studies requirement. And what I am looking at with students is um, music and ethnicity within the state of Wisconsin. So um, again, I, I really love the opportunity to teach non-majors as well as um, our majors and undergraduates and graduate students. Phenomenal. Was it your love of Wisconsin that made you choose uh, to, to basically live your career out here at UW-Madison? Well, absolutely. This part of the country, um, you know, you, you, you choose jobs for all sorts of reasons. And I, I came here um, knowing that I wanted to be here for a while. And yes, absolutely have, have really fallen in love with the country, uh, this part of the country. And um, now with my, my children sort of choosing to either be here in Madison and one child in the Twin Cities, uh, it's a pretty perfect place to be. Yeah, I agree with you wholeheartedly. We have another question posted. Can the performance spaces be acoustically fine-tuned for different types of performance? For example, Baroque on period instruments versus modern symphony orchestra? That is a Fabulous question. Uh, absolutely. I think as I was giving the tour, uh, I may have pointed out the draperies that are in both spaces. I think in the Collins recital hall in particular, they're the orange draperies that, that cover up the wallpaper or not. So it's, it's easier to see them, but they're also draperies in the large space. And so absolutely, we spent several days with the, the acousticians and our different individual solo performers and of course we have a number of faculty ensembles um, quartets quintets as well as the large ensembles and each of the conductors or the members of those groups being able to truly fine-tune like where did they want those draperies to come down how much sound absorption did they want how um you can think of it as how wet or how dry you want the space how resonant you want the space or not and so it's a very different setup for say, when the Wisconsin Brass Quintet is in a space versus when the Pro Arte uh, Quartet is in a space. So absolutely, the question about uh, period instruments, kinds of instruments, absolutely. We have a lot of capacity to, to really fine tune both the small recital space and the large um, concert hall, and also in the rehearsal space with students so that we can really bring down that dampening curtains so that we are absorbing as much energy on the walls and so that energy is not going into the students' ears for musician health concerns. That flexibility is so important. And I was impressed uh, being a fan of our local convention center here in Madison, which was designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, that circular theme, which apparently Wright 
produced in Monona Terrace to mimic the dome of the Capitol. But also I just noticed all of the arches and circles in this building. And of course, bringing the outside in, which you also mentioned, such a Wrightian characteristic. Yes, absolutely. You're right. The the circle, I, I don't remember the architect saying specifically that that was a, a Frank Lloyd Wright touch, but we certainly know that he was interested in the outside in. And I think the Claire Story windows that go around the top of the Collins Recital Hall very much right touches. But the circle, I think, is just always a, a wonderful image for building community as well. So, yes, you'll see the circular theme in the um, uh, the, the the polka dots in the big hall, the the the, the staircase that's um, downstairs in the lobby. Um, so yes, absolutely circular treatments, even on the wall coverings in the rehearsal room, lots of overlapping circles. So yeah, wow. it's, a, it's a wonderful, you know, embracing uh, image. Yeah, that's fantastic. We have another question, uh, again from Susan Stemper. How about lead and or environmental considerations? In the well, of course, we wanted to have this be as environmentally friendly as possible. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry to say, Susan, I, I don't remember exactly the LEED certification that we did get on it, but we did everything within our uh, capability to do that. I think sometimes the LEED um, uh, has to do with when the build, when you take down a building, and, and of course we weren't doing that, so we didn't have the whole recycling issue, but we very much wanted to make it as, um, as friendly a building, and again, also a building that would uh, be able to be here for a long time as well. That's another consideration is that we're building something that's it's really here to last. Yeah, we're, we're very lucky to have this building on our campus. And I've heard from many, many students saying that it's just a dream playing in that concert hall with the acoustics the way it is. Uh, Susan, can you tell us where people check out a com upcoming events at Hamill and how can they uh, come here at concert? Day? Multiple places. So you can just go to the events at uh, wisc.edu site. Our, all of our events are, of course, brought in there. Uh, but I'd, I'd rather that you come to our direct uh, Mead Witter School of Music uh, website. Uh, you'll see more of our, our, our particular events there with more descriptions as well. So that's the best place is just to come to our Mead Witter School of Music website and um, the events are right there up on the, the, the top. Uh, and we always have so many things going on, uh, various kinds, and, and we're so delighted to be back in person again and uh, playing for each other and playing with each other. And I'm particularly excited because I heard Dan Grabois, who was on our talk last week, is having a recital coming up on, I think, next Wednesday. So yep. we have a lot of things coming up. We have um, the, the orchestra and the wind ensemble on Friday and Saturday of this week. Um, more events as we go into October, of course, and the students have had a chance to be back together and rehearsing together. Uh, so a lot of things coming up. Susan C. Cook, thank you so much. For joining us on Badger Talks Live today. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. And um, again, I, I look forward to welcoming people in person into the new space. Thanks a bunch. Everybody, please join us uh, as we continue Badger Talks Live with a celebration of the 2021 Wisconsin Science Festival next month. And we're going to be kicking that off on Tuesday, October 5th, with Ann Pringle, who's an, a distinguished achievement professor of botany and bacteriology. And she's gonna be talking about mushrooms and fungi and the problems that occur when they are invasive. The series will continue October 12th with philosophy prof professors Larry Shapiro and Steve Nadler talking about one of their upcoming books, when bad thinking happens to good people. And then October 19th, we're gonna be talking with the co-founder, co-founders of the Wisconsin Science Festival, Laura Heisler and George Sugros. And they're gonna be giving an insider's guide to the festival and how you can participate virtually or in person. Please visit our website at badgertalks.wist.edu where you can see the link to our podcast with Ben Rush. We're having some fun conversations out there, Ben and upcoming speakers uh, talks live and he recently did a conversation with Susan Cook so you can check that out. See the upcoming schedule of live talks, sign up for our email list, please consider a donation to Badger Talks Live, or you can search the roster of over 400 speakers who have generously donated their time to give talks at your location around the state. Thanks for tuning in everybody and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.